When Young Park was young, she uh, grew up really loving antiques and so would spend a lot of time um, in antique shops and collecting and was sort of recognized even at like around the age 13 for her eye. So she was given no instructions by her mentors. They just let her pick what she liked from various different antique um, stores and she would sort of curate these little displays and I think that that really informed a lot of what is so iconic about her work. It's this combination of story and history and an awareness of tradition and a sort of keen and refined aesthetic. And that was very sort of um, a formative, uh, began in childhood for her. Um, as she got older, she her husband ran a gallery um, and uh, Around the age 32, 33, when her children, her young children were more school-aged, <clears throat> she took up ceramic as a hobby. So she talks about it as though she was sort of like very old to get into it, even though I don't consider 30s to be old, um, but uh, didn't really pick up the actual creation of work until, um, until she started taking ceramics classes when her children had gone into school. And immediately, her teachers recognized that she really had a knack for it and encouraged her to continue. And so she sort of had some fast success in that way and was given various different exhibitions. Um, uh, and just, it became the thing that she loves to do more than anything, even to this day, she's actively creating. Um, and so that was sort of how she got into it. And she had various different mentors that encouraged her, probably the most well-known would be Liu Fan. And they directed her to really um, focus on, on porcelain. Um, and she saw that as a challenge, one that was very difficult for her at first, but um, you know, eventually paid off. Um, porcelain is an extremely difficult medium to work in, and to achieve it is, uh, it takes just an enormous amount of time and energy and um, you know for example she it took her over 10 years before she was really able to have a successful moon jar come out of the count but the first thing that she really did in terms of white porcelain was to create an entire dinnerware set <clears throat> uh, that was that was an instruction that Lee Lupin had given to her so for her dinnerware which we can take a look at um, it, it has all different shapes and so it was sort of like Lee told her that it, she can make all of these different forms and perfect that and on this very small scale then, then that would sort of be the best um, foundation for her to then carry it forth and start to make larger um, pieces and, and more decorative pieces versus functional. Um, so the dinnerware set and, and really perfecting that was like her first big achievement. Um, and then she transitioned into working on trying to make a moon jar which took a really long time and that's obviously much larger than a cup but similar in shape. Um, and so that was a little bit of the trajectory of her, her career bringing us up until uh, the early aughts. Um, and now she's creating even larger moon jars and, and doing her collaborations with Leo Fawn, which are really playing a lot, a lot with glaze. Um, so that's sort of the, the next phase of it. If we're thinking about like the time period, it's the late 70s and she first um, opened her, her kiln and uh, started to create in her own studio. Um, and so there's this combination of um, like you're saying, like she's sort of teaching herself. I mean, she's, she's got lots of teachers, but she's not going through that traditional art school <coughs> trajectory. Uh, but we're also looking at, at Korea at that moment in time, and the fact that so much of the tradition of Korean ceramic was just unknown. Um, so it's not like she could uh, really fill in the gaps of what was even understood about how the jars were made. Um, nobody really knew that, you know, speaking to the, to the chosen dynasty specifically. So there's this, you know, uh, we have some work and she can kind of like um, look to those, but a lot of what she was trying to do was not just earn, like learn the technical craft of it, but also wanting to revive the tradition, which um, 
as I said, is sort of like there's gaps in, in, in the understanding of that. But also this awareness that Korean ceramic is sort of maybe overlooked and wanting to bring it into a contemporary conversation where um, it can then be uh, sort of recanonized re on a different level. Um, so there's this combination of, of, even if she had gone through a traditional training, there's not one person who could tell her exactly how to do it. So this is a lot of trial and error. And when you're working with porcelain in particular, it's so much about the actual clay. And then there's this period, this lag time, right? So she's working with clays, and then she's, she's getting them exactly the way she wants, and then they're going into the kiln, but they don't look the way that she envisions them to look. And so <clears throat> um, sort of having to learn the chemistry of it and the best materials and the best way to go about that is also a part of you know what she's learning in these early stages and it's gotten to the point now where you know much of her clay that she um, is using will actually like uh, she has it gestating for 10 years sometimes um, and playing around with combining um, different clay from the earth different materials into the clay there's sort of this secret recipe that she's figured out is the best uh, you know, it's going to have the best outcome, um, but there's the only way that she could get there, that anyone could get there, is just by doing it and the time that it takes, not just to learn it, but to also uh, let the materials be ready um, in that way. And uh, so that that is, I would use the word. I mean, it maybe has not not a positive connotation, but she would say she's obsessed with it. So it's sort of like. You know, if you have an idea in your mind of what you want something to look like and it's not there, um, it's just this like continual challenge for her. Um, and so much of that is really uh, something that she's sort of doing in, in her in her own way. In terms of um, maybe the art historical considerations, and Lee Fong was a really uh, a big part of this. That. Um, that creates the idea of what she wants for it to look like, and that's a combination of color and form being in perfect harmony, the translucency uh, of, of the whiteness of the porcelain. Um, so she knows that she wants for it to look like that. That's coming from doing research, from Lee, uh, uh, encouraging her to, um, at one point she was going to Japan and, and going to the libraries and just doing all of this research about what she wants for it to look like and what she's trying to do and then going back and trying and, and then having to play around on a technical level in order to to achieve that so that's sort of um how, how it's going for her yeah I think that that's where you know she's landed. Um, uh, like it really does start with the materials. I think that that's probably the case for for lots of different you know things, even with cooking. You know, having really good ingredients. Um, so that's certainly her uh, belief now. Um, I'm not sure in the beginning when she's sort of learning, like if uh, how much of that she inherently knew. Um, but she's very particular about her clay. And um, it's all sourced from you know one region, and then she, as I said, does a secret recipe thing to it. Lets it, um, uh, you know, get to the point where um, it's it's going to be ready to fire, which is is, is takes years, usually six to ten years. Um, but that was something that she learned maybe the hard way. I'm not sure how you would learn it um, any other way, but by firing different types of clay or firing the clay before um, it gets to this sort of like perfect moment, um, which is an intuitive thing for her. She's sort of checking on it and, and, and knows when it's there, but it's not like, you know, you put it in the oven and then, okay, now it's ready. Um, so uh, she, she has gotten to that, that place. And, um, you know, I think that there's also this awareness that it is a finite resource. You know, someday the clays will run out and there'll be no more. Um, also, once it's fired, <clears throat> you can't you can't just uh, make it clay again. It's like forever altered in that way. 
So she's even referred to it as like a karmic, a karmic thing um, because she's, uh, it, it's not recyclable after that. So she wants to make sure that before it gets fired, um, she's done everything that she can to make sure that it's got the best possibility for success. Um, and even then, you know, you've got um, quite a few pieces that are going to come out and, and end up not being able to be used. Um, so that, that's a part of it. And I think it does weigh he heavy on her. The way that she makes them, the way that anybody who's making them makes them, um, by creating two bowls. Uh, so they're thrown on a wheel, <clears throat> and then the two pieces, while still on the wheel, so with somebody helping her, um, are put together and, and, and seamed. So that creates this sort of diamond shape, the shape of a, of a moon for which they're named. Um, and of course, this uh, sort of asymmetry uh, is maybe structurally difficult to make sure that it's, uh, it's not going to collapse, as we said, like in the kiln. So you've got to make sure that you've got a structurally sound, asymmetrical object by these two bowls put together. Um, and uh, once you've got that, then you're going to do the bisque firing. Uh, they'll come back out and they'll be glazed. Um, on the cracked majority, you can see that um, so as I said, like when they collapse, partially collapse, uh, this is an example of that. So I actually have people that will ask me if that's intentional, and it's like, how intentional? There's always this sort of you know, factor with the kiln that you, you're not, you, you just don't know exactly what's going to happen. But this is an example of something that, when it was going through a vitrification process, uh, partially collapsed and created this really aesthetically interesting, I, I find it beautiful, uh, crack in the clay. But what is also really cool about that is that you can see all the way through that the glaze um, and the clay are like the same whiteness. So um, if you take another porcelain object or um, uh, anything that's glazed and you crack it in half, you're going to see that the glaze is sitting on top of the clay and that it's not sort of like um, seamlessly uh, the same color, uh, but this is this allows me to see just how pristine and white the clay is, even without that top glaze that goes on top of it. Um, so this is not white because uh, it's been like painted with something that's looking white. But this is the actual clay. You know, what she's really wanting to do is to sort of distill the aesthetic essence of, um, of the work that she wants to achieve and, um, and then take it to another level. Um, and that's a combination of being able to because of um, uh, uh, just modern technology and um, the type of kiln that, you know, just didn't exist um, uh, until these days. Um, but also, you know, life is different now, and so um, she can make them larger. She can uh, use the um, canon of art history to think through the ways that she might add decorative marks to them. So that um, tends to be, I mean, a lot of that, uh, the um, moon jars that have marks on them, that this is a collaboration with Liu Fan, but you know, it's got a very modern kind of minimalist aesthetic that, you know, is very different than what you might see um, <clears throat> in terms of glaze, decorative glaze um, on older pieces. And that's just this sort of um, intuitive uh, awareness that, you know, we are, 
in some ways the same humans that were here thousands of years before. We have the same needs and wants and desires, but also life is very different. And so kind of honoring both of those things at the same time, this sort of harmony between um, uh, the past and our ancestors and, you know, the, that they're the reason that we're here and that there is a sort of universal thing that is, you know, art and, uh, and, and being a uh, human, um, but also that we're in this very specific moment in time and, that, you know, that, that, that that's grounded in um, the work that she's making now. So it's that, that aesthetic and then also the sort of the, the technical thing that's wanting to, like, take it to the next level, sort of make it her own, um, while also honoring the history that came before her. first entered Yangtze Park's life, it was very much like a mentor, and that's evolved to be more of a partnership and collaboration over the last four decades now. Um, but as I had um, mentioned, the first thing that she really tackled in terms of white porcelain and uh, was at uh, the encouragement of Leo Pong was to create the dinner wear set. So they, she was working out um, the technical component of being able to actually create uh, the various different components of a, dinner, of a dinnerware set, but there's the aesthetic as well, so they're sort of working together on that, and you can see that, that this very simple mark, um, that's the influence of Liu Fan, and, and that's on all of the dinnerware. So this is sort of like the origin story of that, of that partnership. And this piece here, just to sort of flash forward, is uh, what they did in 2017. So this mentorship that um, began by just encouraging her and maybe um, working with her in terms of the aesthetic considerations of what she's actually creating, uh, then evolves into a situation where she's, cre she's creating a porcelain plate and he's actually physically painting on uh, on the porcelain, so they're in the kiln working together um, to, you know, bring these two pieces, uh, uh, two parts of the piece together. Um, so as I said, this has been going on for 40-ish for uh, years. Um, some of the earlier collaborations that we have, which I have on this plate over here, which I can show you, um, you know, these are maybe 2007, 2003, this is when you're going to start to see uh, the first pieces of where Liu Fan is um, painting onto the ceramic, and they're smaller in scale. So these more recent collaborations that happened in 2017 and then 2019, and then I think that they were also together this summer, um, they're getting bigger and bigger. So this is also because her craft has become better and better, and she's able to make larger and larger pieces, but they're also playing around um, with the glaze. And so she uses true glazes. They're actually, um, uh, they're not paint or pigment. They're uh, different elements. So the cobalt um, creates this blue, and the iron is, uh, creates this sort of like uh, layered brown. And I don't have um, the copper, but the copper glaze will make a red. So um, the thing about that is that it's, very difficult to know exactly the way that the glaze is going to come out because there's this chemistry component to it and the elements are going to act very strangely in the kiln so you might think that you've covered the piece and that it's consistent um, and it's going to come out you know perfectly blue but it'll come out and some parts of it will be deeper than the others you can see that too um, and uh, you just really don't know until it comes until it comes out, and it can become more and more intuitive. But this was sort of a big risk for the both of them because it's the first time that they're trying um, to layer different glazes together in this way. Before 2017, you're going to see pieces that will just have the iron glaze on them, or just have the cobalt, or just have the um, copper, and not both of them together. So, so the risk in that is how will the 
elements work together and then work together when they're fired at these really high temperatures. Um, and also how will the aesthetic look? Um, and again, you know, if it, if it goes badly, you've lost all of this work and, and this precious clay, so you, you know, she doesn't, they don't want that to happen, but wanting to take it to the next level and constantly sort of push um, the boundaries of what's possible uh, resulted in this collaboration where they're playing around with the multiple different um, uh, elements together. It's this iron and cobalt. And um, yeah, as I said, they, uh, they're they still working together, um, even now, and they're both, I think, in their 70s and 80s, respectively. Um, so it's been a friendship and a partnership that's um, lasted a lifetime. With ceramic, you, you can flip past things, which is that you have a mold and you're pouring those things into a mold versus hand building something, you know, on the wheel or, or um, just uh, making it, it's, it's not cast in that way. So with the slip cast, you know, this is um, what she's using for the dinnerware and for something like the apples. Um, she's, in terms of what she actually is making, it's very informed, it's sort of whimsically informed by her foods in that way. And so, um, for example, she started to make the, um, the birds that are on the wall over here uh, when her grandchildren were born and they were playing in the yard and they loved the animals and so you can see that this is this is sort of affecting her mood and making her want to um, make things that are inspired by those kinds of experiences. With the apples specifically, that was the result of a trip to New York, um, the big apple. So she thought that that really represented so much and it was something that she could she could make. And even though they're slip cast, they're all uniquely hand glazed. So they're, you know, very, uh, they're all uh, different in terms of the colors that she can make them and the sizes. You can see here, we've got one that's a little bit smaller. Um, these are all white porcelain. So uh, she does make them in Bunchang, but um, these are white porcelain. So they are very lightweight and partially hollow on, on the inside, but, um, uh, you know, they're, they're, the boonchong is much heavier and they're solid in that way, but you know, I don't know exactly what they would look like if you cracked them in half because I've never done that. <laughs> um, but this is also really cool because you can again see how perfectly white the clay is, even where the white porcelain glaze is ending. Um, and this is an example of the copper, so you can just see how vividly red it is. We've got these that are um, uh, able to hang on the wall. These are all just examples of her wanting to continue to play. She doesn't want to keep doing the exact same thing forever. So she's going to challenge herself, try different shapes and forms, and let the things that are happening in her life be inspired, uh, inspiring her. Um, these are more recent. These just came from the kiln maybe a couple years ago. So you can see this is she's adding a bird to them. So she's taking the idea of the apple and then kind of like adding another uh, component to it. Um, and she's been making, um, in terms of the smaller objects, a lot of birds and different little creatures. So that's kind of new um, for her as well. And then playing around again with the glazes um, in that way. So yeah, the apple is New York. <laughs> So we've opened, we opened this gallery in 2017, but we've had different spaces in New York City going back to, I believe, 2000 or 2001. Um, and so much of the idea behind that was really carrying forth this idea of if Young Street Park wants to elevate the um, awareness and just uh, the, of Korean ceramic, um, even within Korea and within the East, uh, she's also trying to do that here in the United States. Um, there's an added layer here uh, in New York and, and in, in the United States where you know a lot of Americans are maybe not familiar at all with um, Korean ceramic or Chinese ceramic or any sort of Asian ceramic. And uh, additionally, the uh, United States and uh, maybe the West in general, is more going to categorize um, ceramic into something like 
folk or um, <clears throat> uh, craft, fine art craft, and that that is seen a little differently than maybe fine art, and they're separated, which is not really something that happens um, in Korea or in the East, but it, it does happen here. So, so much of what we do in this space is have a conversation with people and educate them. So that's a, that's a really big part of um, bringing the work here, is being able to have those conversations, to have those educational conversations, and really talk about what porcelain is and uh, what the history of Korean ceramic is in a way that isn't necessarily happening in a lot of other places here in New York or even in the United States. Um, so that's a, a lot of the mission of what we are doing with the gallery and what she wants to do with bringing her work um, over here and sharing it with new audiences. I think in general, using an object or an art object is a really great way to have a conversation about history um, and so it becomes almost like this catalyst to talk about so many other things. Um, when people come into the gallery, you know, they're not sure what they're looking at. And so when I'm talking about the pieces, I'm not just talking about the, um, the work itself, but I'm also talking about the history of Korea and why this work is so significant and such an achievement. Uh, not just on a technical level, but because there were so many gaps in knowing, you know, what she's even doing when she's starting to do that. So it launches into a conversation as well about, about history. Um, so there's so much that is wrapped up in just this one object uh, to be a vehicle of um, not just aesthetic appreciation, but historical conversation um, that wouldn't be happening otherwise. And so that's really what our hope is in terms of, um, of, of inviting people to come in and look at the work and, and talk to us about it. Um, and I, I think that that is, uh, it's so unique in that way. It's such a different thing than, um, to, you know, photography or paintings or something like that, that first of all, the audiences might be more familiar with seeing, um, but is going to really just kind of exist in some ways as an, as an aesthetic object or an object that is mm, uh, really uniquely tied to its creator in that way. This gets to be both. It gets to be something that this, this artist made, but that also represents so much um, history, thousands of years of history, um, not just in the creation of it, but all of the different factors that make um, us understand or not understand certain things about the moon jar, um, lost histories that are now being revived through those conversations. So yeah, so we're located in Chelsea in New York on 10th Avenue, 175 10th Avenue, uh, between 20th and 21st Street, and we are open, so I hope that you'll come by and talk with us about the work and see it in person, and I look forward to those conversations.